Hello, my name is Peter Kjærulf, and welcome to Nepal. Um, this is what I looked like in 1983. As these photos might sometimes just take a brief part of a second to be clear. I, I think I'll start with just reading what I have uh, written in the description. In uh, April 1983, I spent three weeks trekking in the Himalayas. The journey in this incredible landscape turned out to be an emotional as well as a visually breathtaking experience. And luckily I brought my Olympus OM2 with a 50mm 1.8 lens. The film stock used was Kodachrome 64 and 25. I, brought, I bought 15 films and shot almost 500 slides. Here are some of them. My friend Bo Ulfhoi, who unfortunately is not among us anymore, was our guide on this trip. He paid half of my expenses so that there were the correct number of participants to meet the demands of the travel agency. I dedicate this video to Bo, with whom, along with another friend, I shared a large apartment for a number of years in the 70s and 80s. Nepal in 1983 was different from today. Maybe I've made a small historical document about ways of life back then. I'd like to think that. And uh, the, the next one um, is actually Bo's uh, photograph. This is Mount Everest seen from a, shall we call, a small hill of only 5,500 meters called Kalapata. And uh, the um, aim for the trip was this Kalapata. And, and when I saw this photo Bo had taken some years earlier, I said, I want to go there. Uh, Bo was um, a tour guide in uh, Tibet and Pakistan and Nepal. And uh, I have seen a lot of his slides. And uh, when we went to Nepal, uh, which was really incredible for me to go as far away from Denmark as there, uh, I expected a lot of this. I don't think uh, I expected to see this immediately, but my first Im impression of uh, Nepal was this. This is just after landing in Kathmandu, after Trans, uh, trans, what is it called? Uh, in in uh, we landed in Frankfurt and uh, to uh, Delhi in India and then to Kathmandu, and um, we drove from the airport to the hotel, and I saw these big big billboards which we didn't have in Denmark at that time, and I was fascinated by this Everest toothpaste, <laughs> which I think is it's a wonderful thing to have. After having settled in the, um, the Hotel Narayani, um, a few of us went to the, the nearest part of the town just to, to see what was going on. Um, this film, Kodachrome 65, which I used in the beginning, and also the later Kodachrome 25, 64, and the later uh, 25, uh, has a very sharp contrast between light and dark which in some cases might be a little different, difficult to see, but uh, the details are very sharp. And, well, there were some religious things here. These stupas are spread uh, around the entire town, and uh, it's said there is uh, somewhere in the middle there is a sacred thing, a part of some saint a bone or something, and in, in this uh, small altar here, they offer spices and flowers, and they come here every day, as far as I can see. But some children may have found it fun to climb there. I just started as uh, if it was uh, uh, going into a film set. It was so strange from Denmark. And I noticed these guys uh, working and sleeping on these vans, and so, well, they have plenty of time, apparently, here. And there were children, lots and lots of children, all over the place. And dogs. I photographed this dog 
And and uh, <coughs> only when I returned to Denmark and the film uh, developed, I saw there's also a dog over here, which I didn't actually see in the first place. And um, children, as I said, and um, they are playing with stones and in an old bus here. And um, everything is quite dirty, actually. And there's a smell of smoke and um, butter, tea and spices. And the, the air is very different from Denmark. And it was, well, 23 Celsius degrees, I think. So I just noticed these different shops, uh, which were quite interesting to see because uh, I haven't seen anything like that before. I didn't bring a tape recorder. If I did, I, there would be some documents, actually. This guy was apparently sleeping, and, and this uh, radio or whatever it was up here um, was turned up to, I think, maximum, and, and some kind of American pop music was pouring all over the street. And then we came to the square of this part of Kathmandu, where um, everyone seemed to to gather. There's a really a, a lot of things going on here, with markets, um, groceries, and, and these red things to um, put into your hair. We saw several women with that put into the the hair and all these uh, souvenir sellers always saying, I'll find a very special price for you. Um, or naturally, uh, that's of course in Danish, um, we bought some things now and then. Uh, but we, as it would turn up, uh, out, we would uh, meet these, meet these uh, sellers everywhere, even all the way up to almost every base camp. Um, in Kathmandu, there is apparently a different um, kind of religions blending. Uh, these are, as far as I know, uh, uh, Indian girls in the Indian British uh, school uniforms. And there were Nepalese people and Tibetan people and Hindu people among each other. And in a square such as this, everything took place. Uh, breast feeding, um, changing diapers, talking to everyone, one, and uh, with beautiful clothing and a lot of artifacts and things. There were so many children. And uh, <clears throat> some of them were, as you can see, this little girl, quite uh, dirty as far as I can see. And um, the rings around the ankles, uh, I think, was some religious thing, and, and uh, she had company by chicken. And uh, when I looked into one of the yards, there were apparently also children from um, parents of a more wealthier kind. They were better dressed and clean. Um, this is one of the holes in the ground on the squares where you get your water and, and wash your hair and wash your clothes. Um, and I just studied, I looked everywhere around to take in this, for me, completely different way of life. And uh, <coughs> as I said, dogs, a lot of dogs, and apparently dogs, um, stray dogs, and naked children running around, even they had some kind of, uh, some of the children had some kind of trousers where there was, shall we say, a, a hole in the middle <laughs> so that they could do what uh, they needed to do but still have some kind of cover for their legs. And there was a little guy with a, a bell tied to one of his shoes so that wherever his he went, um, her mother, his mother could uh, hear where he was. And these dogs, um, they were not... Uh, coming towards us. We, we met that later on. But what I'd noticed when we 
Owen slept, uh, we slept a couple of days in Kathmandu before going to the trekking um, experience. That, um, well, in, in Denmark, in the summer, if you have a garden and you wake up at around three or four in the morning, you have birds singing in a wonderful, wonderful choir, as you can hear in the beginning of Ravel's Daphnis and Chloe Suite Number no. 2. In, in Kathmandu, they have dogs barking. So that if you wake uh, up at around three o'clock in the morning and one dog starts, then gradually there is a crescendo. And before long, you have uh, something like 3,000 dogs barking. And then gradually it subsides and, and, and disappears again. And then <laughs> one dog starts again <laughs> and it goes all over again. Um, the children uh, looked us, uh, at us um, and shouted, uh, Namaste, hello, goodbye, hello, goodbye. And uh, they were uh, begging uh, all the time. We were told by our uh, tour leader, Bo, that um, the Nepalese government said we should not give them anything because they didn't want to raise a generation of beggars. This is apparently a schoolyard, and, and there's a souvenir salesman in, in the middle, because it has some connection with the street. Well, this I somehow expected to see, <coughs> the, the wisdom of the East. I don't know anything about this man, uh, but he's very, shall we say, spectacular. Or this, this is maybe a guru who doesn't talk, or I don't know. But he is surely attracting a lot of tourists who want to take his uh, photograph, and he would like very much to have some rupees for the photograph. Uh, this photo I took because uh, the, the, the noise and the going to and fro in this busy street of Kathmandu and just to the left from, from my feet, there is this guy, and uh, he seemed to be dead because he was so still that you couldn't tell that he was asleep, but he was probably asleep or drunk or something like that. Um, we had some discussions about w what to see in Nepal, and my friend Bo, who, had, uh, who was a, a Buddhist, and he uh, spoke, uh, he spoke a bit Nepali and a bit Tibetan. Actually, he he came actually to photograph the mountains and all the beautiful temples, and he was a bit shocked that I photographed something which might look like poverty and dirt. But but I wanted to simply see what it's all about. And cows, there were cows everywhere. And um, I was told that yeah, there's a penalty. If you kick them or push them you, you might, or harm them, you might get into prison because they are holy and they are really everywhere. And um, there was a cow on a roof somewhere. Uh, I didn't get my camera out there. Uh, this is just uh, on the way to the busy part of center of uh, Kathmandu and these uh, temples, there was a lot of these temple buildings as you can see here. And uh, if I look up to the left, somebody is, uh, some guys, some people are building a house. We saw that several places that they um, form groups and like uh, lines with uh, bricks and baskets and, and build one story uh, more to a house like that. Uh, I'm not quite sure, but I think these guys are Indian. This one over here is a shopper. You can see because of the um, the hat. Uh, and uh, shopper is uh, mountain people uh, best known for working as guides on uh, mountaineering. But um, I, I'm, I'm just uh, giving my immediate impression. If I'm factually wrong, please forgive me. But uh, they were 
um, guides or uh, chauffeurs on these uh, um, bikes there they could have a, a tour round Kathmandu and we saw families like this um, two children and this special kind of way to carry things if you remove the strap from the head um, some of the hair might be gone that was uh, quite usual to see men especially where the, the hair was kind of worn down on that place where you strap the basket to your back and I was still fascinated by children playing <coughs> and <coughs> lots of them seem to be playing with nothing else but small stones or what they could find well this is me actually and uh, just to give a, a glimpse of this uh, main street where even if it's very narrow as you can see there were motorbikes and bikes and cars and uh, in, in Kathmandu, well, they say they have the third eye, but apparently they have the third hand, meaning that they have one hand, two, two hands on the wheel and one hand on the horn. Constantly, there's a lot of noise from cars and motorcycles constantly beeping and hooting. And um, I was um, impressed of this uh, scaffolding, or what you call it, to the right of bamboo, which is... Uh, also different from wh what I'm used to know. And um, this uh, is the river running through Kathmandu, the Bagmati River. And uh, this, we, we are in April, and um, it's quite dried out at the moment. And from where I could stand, uh, it was a bit dirty. But, um, well, you can bathe in it anyway. And this... Uh, concrete columns um, are used for burning the dead and we saw that at a later time here and uh, <coughs> after I had taken this photograph I turned around and saw this guy and felt somehow ashamed as if I had uh, transgressed some privacy border there's um, souvenirs all over the place. You, you can buy uh, pictures of uh, any kind of uh, Buddhist or uh, Hinduistic religious symbols. And uh, then there's the monkey. You can see there's a monkey on the top of this. And uh, we, we were uh, in here you, um, visiting Pashupatinath, which is a Hindu temple. And there was quite a few monkeys. And uh, <clears throat> this monkey actually jumped down and hang clang onto a plastic bag I, I had and uh, there was a, a, a boy who uh, chased it away luckily because it might be dangerous. And this is this uh, Hindu Pashupasinat temple where you have only access if you are a Hindu. There's a lot of temples of different uh, beliefs in Kathmandu. You have the uh, the Buddhist stupas like this one, uh, Bhadanath stupa, and you have uh, Christian uh, churches. Our local guide was a Catholic uh, he, uh, Indian guy, and uh, and you have the the Hindu uh, temples as well. Uh, I. I, I was told the number of temples uh, to be about, I, I think, a couple of hundred actually in Kathmandu, but I'm, I'm not quite sure I remember that exactly. Um, this place here yeah, where you have the praying flags on, on lines from the top of the stupa, uh, there was a very, very quiet atmosphere and you could walk around it and everywhere you came there were children begging but it, it was like there is a kind of sacred atmosphere here. And uh, I saw this old Tibetan monk. And behind the, the metal framing there, there are these prayer mills. So you can put a hand in and, and turn the prayer mills. And then there is a prayer going to the gods, which is a 
practical thing, I think. And um, I quite, kind of love this um, photo from the Badalat area. Uh, if you really look carefully, there are th three dogs, a cow, a goat, three children and a Buddhist monk. Uh, in just in one go. Then we uh, went to um, Bhaktapur, which is a village east of Kathmandu. And this is Durba Square. And there were some very beautiful temples here. And uh, Bhaktapur was actually uh, quite demolished in a great earthquake of 2015. So uh, this is what it looks like in 1983, before the earthquake. I believe they have tried to reconstruct uh, just a large part of that. Uh, in Bhaktapur there was also this place where there was a pottery and um, this guy here seemed to be a virtuoso. Um, I, I was constantly afraid that he his feet might get into that uh, turning. This uh, wheel of concrete is, is turning, or cement, is turning in, in a ferocious speed. <laughs> so it, it must be like sandpaper if one of his toes touches it. And at this this place, like in a lot of other places, um, people gather. You can see o over here there's uh, like tea uh, cons consumption and talk. And, and here the children are stamping straw and mud to, to get the, the clay ready for building bricks or something. And uh, this mother here is uh, breastfeeding and things. And there's one of us, a tourist, and small children. And uh, it was quite a humming of life. And, and it's quite quiet here, actually. Um, as opposite to, to this, uh, again, if I had a tape recorder, you can see that these uh, <coughs> cards here, they have metal wheels and they made an infamous noise. And uh, 17, 18 years old teenage boys were, were uh, speeding up and down this road on motorcycles. So an incredible noise in, in this uh, otherwise very quiet place. This is just to illustrate these <laughs> uh, tall European guys with a bow, our, our tour guide and my friend in the middle, in the center, and um, the, the guy in the blue shirt, Michael Lepali, the Christian Indian who was our local tour guide. And uh, we seem to, to very tall compared with uh, Nepalese, and they are heavily loaded. And uh, this guy in the most right, uh, what was uh, in, in these uh, bags on the shoulder, the, this bamboo stick was waving up and down, and there were uh, bricks, uh, lots and lots and lots of bricks in these um, bags, or what, what we call it. And, um, well, very strange for a European uh, in 1983. And these girls, they, they are, have some kind of makeup around the eyes, um, as I was told, in order to get rid of evil spirits. And, but they are very confidential looking and say, say always say, hello, goodbye. And then they stretch out one hand and say, well, one rupee, one rupee. We came, uh, there should, uh, there just had been, I think, a great parade where elephants was in front of this uh, um, mighty cart here with uh, flowers and flowers and flowers. And I'm sorry we missed that, but um, still got an, an impression of what might be going on um, on a daily basis on festivals and things. Uh, this was um, quite interesting. I, I didn't go to study it, but you can see that uh, here there are some beams 
holding the, the roofs in the different stories. And on these beams, there were carved uh, more than 100 different sexual positions. So if you want to learn about how to do it, you have just to go and visit the square. And uh, this is a typical with uh, a hole in the ground where you can get water and wash and a child and a cow, which is everywhere in a souvenir shop. And also here, uh, there should have been sound. This is a school. And as you sometimes have experienced, maybe yourself, that uh, in schools, some of the pupils will prefer to sit uh, at the window and look down in the street. And um, the sound was that uh, there was a lot of children saying like the same thing in a, uh, as in a chorus. And um, it was... Well, I, I was moved in, in a way, and they looked at me and waved, and they were very, very nice, these two girls there. Um, I guess this is for making saris. I can't be sure. But um, having the weaver out in the open is, is nice if uh, you, you haven't, have, have not too much rain. Well, now this idea is we are going out here. This is a very uh, famous Buddhist temple, the Svayampunat. And um, this is here, uh, this is me, uh, and this is the Kathmandu scene of it from above. And here there is a very different atmosphere from the Bhadanat stup uh, stupa in Kathmandu. This was clearly a tourist attraction thing. And uh, one thing I refused to photograph was the way up there. There was a path, on, and on both sides of that path, there were uh, cripples with clearly broken legs and broken arms, like, uh, well, I'm... I'm I'm, I'm not uh, joking here, legs broken like in angles in order to um, make good beggars. This is what I was told also, that as uh, some parents actually cripple their children in order to make them better beggars. And um, I, I didn't want to photograph them and I didn't want to give them any money, uh, even though my well, I was crying inside, but I, I, I didn't know what to do. I just passed them and hoped that this uh, nonsense will stop one day. We went inside, and because there wasn't too much light there, it's a big, bit uh, shaky, but we were welcome to come in. And uh, there was a Buddhist uh, ceremony um, going on with uh, chanting, and we... Um, gave them some money and, and then they were, we were welcome to come in and see what was going on in this uh, um, Pashupatinat, no, 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 Svayampunat Buddhist temple. Outside, that was, uh, as far as I could see, a wedding um, progression. And also here, I might have had um, a tape recorder. And I'm going to say this, quite a lot of times because there was so much uh, wonderful music and sound and impressions. But, uh, well, it was in 83, I didn't have one of those. But there was there were musicians here playing. Uh, well, in, in a European sense, you wouldn't call it playing, but making sounds which I'm sure has some meaning, which I did just didn't, didn't understand. Well, the idea was that we were going to fly from Kathmandu to a small airport in the Himalayas called Lukla, and then from Lukla walk uh, to Kalapatar near Everest base camp, uh, and then uh, go back uh, on foot all the way to Kathmandu. But uh, the monsoon was early that year, 
and um, the flight was cancelled. So we changed the plans, and, and here actually starts the trekking itself, where we were driven by a bus uh, out in the country, and then we had to walk a week to Lukla, and then walk to uh, Kalapata, and, and then back, and then fly back from Lukla to Kathmandu. So, Kathmandu. so it was reversed. So this was uh, the first impression of the lower hills of the Himalayas from the bus. And we made a stop uh, along the way. And uh, the bus in the background, well, um, most of the passengers have um, st got, have gone down. Uh, and um, when they're actually driving in the roads, you, you can imagine that up here, there are so many uh, people that let it uh, seems like grass, and um, and then this bus is driving of, of these uh, roads, very uh, un unstable roads. I thought uh, to the edge of the abyss <laughs> with all these people on the roof, and uh, that's our bus here, and everywhere we we come, there are children who. Well, they didn't back that much, these, because they was n n maybe not that tourist uh, acquainted. It is outside Kathmandu. And if you want to buy a new bra, you can do it that uh, over here. Um, it's about nightfall, and we're going to spend the night in tents and then start the trekking. Um, depending on how how the light is on the computer uh, you're watching this you can see there's actually a ridge here in the background and another one here wh which was beautiful uh, the nature here is incredible and um, I was really beginning to feel that uh, we were going to see something uh, extraordinary uh, we had our tents here, and this is the morning, next morning, and we have to walk all the way up here, and up and down and up and down, for a week to get to Lukla. Everywhere there are small tea houses. This is a tea house, you can see in here, and uh, children playing with stones. And uh, you can go in there and you can have uh, dut chai or galut chai, which is tea with milk or tea without milk. I, I think I remember that. And uh, this guy here, I photographed for one reason, and if you look carefully, you might see that the forest behind him is a rhododendron forest in bloom. And if you get to Nepal in the spring, um, you see this phenomenon, which I have never seen before. We have rhododendron bushes in, in Denmark, but not rhododendron trees. The, the road down there is where we came from. And um, now the, the situation is completely different. We are uh, to totally depending on our legs, and uh, we have a um, team of Sherpas, um, very nice guys uh, and girls actually carrying uh, food and uh, making f making food for us and there is a group of uh, porters also uh, carrying the more heavy heavy stuff so we, we had our backpacks uh, not more than 15 kilos I think and each and then uh, all the rest was f carried by porters um, I think this is uh, an incredible photo. And notice this rhododendron tree to the left. And um, uh, the, the correspondence between the different villages go through uh, small paths uh, in the mountains. And here is an, an impression of us uh, having a, a meal and uh, um, Greta is having rhododendron in her hair. and. I did a, a similar thing later, which you will see. And I, I tried to frame this with uh, roses on the top right in order to get a, a photo with the foreground and middle ground and background. And the Sherpas are preparing a meal for us. So this is 
uh, coming to our first uh, overnight um, camp uh, down here in in the bottom, and um, the next day we we went up from there, and you might see some of us here. Well, something unfortunately had happened to me. Um, it might have been some ice cubes in some water I got at the hotel. Uh, we were uh, very careful, but my stomach began to make uh, troubles. Really, really troubles. And, and uh, to walk in the mountains <coughs> with a sick stomach, that's not nice. Um, but um, the story <laughs> will develop. I won't spare the details. <coughs> Um, everywhere there was uh, small farms and huts and tea houses. And these uh, water buffaloes I photographed um, because they, they came to me and started talking to me, some of those water buffaloes. But I had uh, packed down my camera uh, there. But, uh, well, I, I have sometimes in Denmark uh, looked uh, into the eyes of a cow. And it doesn't seem to be very clever. But if you look into the eyes of the of a water buffalo, I, I think this is um, the most stupid thing I have ever encountered. There's absolutely nobody home at all, uh, but they're very nice. This is also one of the photographs I li really love. You meet people and they're very, very kind, and you say namaste, which can mean hello and goodbye and everything else. And they transport things between villages on, on these uh, baskets and uh, have al always some kind of beautiful clothing. And as you can see in the background, they uh, level the fields to grow um, barley and uh, potatoes and other things. And there are these small tea houses whose houses where you go into the left and can order tea, which is uh, actually very nice for uh, a break on on the tour. And it's tiring, and um, we always welcome this little guy. Wanted to get as close to me as possible to see what kind of <laughs> strange person I was, but he was very nice. Well, there's a story behind this. Uh, me and two of the girls. Um, we somehow were in the, in the back of the line, and it was dark. And we were going down a hill, and it was completely dark. And we were nearing, uh, coming uh, close to a village. And we asked everyone, where is the camp? Where is the rest of our team? Where is our tour guide? And they didn't know. And, and then we asked in a house, can we sleep here? We had our sleeping bags with us, and yes, of course you can. And uh, <clears throat> then these two girls and I, we, we lay down of some uh, broad bed of some kinds. And here's one of the stories also where I should have a tape recorder. Because downstairs there was a kind of party with Nepalese music and the, the smell of, um, of smoke and butter tea and spices and uh, hot air. The, the, the air was humid and hot, and it was completely like in a dream or in a fairy tale. But then they found us, and <coughs> of course, because Bo had sent some some of these uh, our shepherds to find us, and they were very, uh, they laughed. You'd got two marriages. Uh, they thought I have two two wives, but um, well, we found the camp which is not far away. And this is the next morning. Some of us are going over here. And um, we are going down and up and down. And you can imagine going 900 altitude meters, altitude meters up and 900 altitude meters down, and then having lunch and then going 900 altitude meters up and 900 altitude meters down with, a, shall we call it, a bleeding stomach. That is not very nice. Um, <laughs> but in, it was in a wonderful nature. But, well, I, I'm actually lay, uh, laying down here. I, I couldn't eat 
anything. Everything we, we ate uh, was, uh, well, it was uh, potatoes and, and pasta and uh, rice and, uh, well, some occasionally some meat. Uh, what, the only thing I could eat at that time was um, canned uh, peach. And uh, as you can see, <clears throat> I'm completely exhausted here. Uh, but uh, after f uh, one day, actually, I regained my strength. And a uh, boat strained an angle, and uh, we had to hire a horse. And um, uh, he, this guy is carrying my uh, rucksack. And um, also, I borrowed the horse, as you can see, where I couldn't <laughs> resist the rhododendron. And um, this is unfortunately a, a copy of one of Bo's slides, uh, hence the colors are not that good. And uh, riding on a horse uh, on, on these uh, mountain roads, th this is, you can't really see that, but this is taken on almost, um, what's it called, um, vertically down. So far, far away there is a river, and the horse is on the edge of the abyss here. And I'm just being lucky that it turns left bef before it, it uh, enters, tumbles down this valley. Um, this was, I think, uh, almost the end of my struggle. And uh, <coughs> when we came to this place, where we could see that the uh, Shepherds had um, raised our tents over there. Um, I had this strange experience that uh, I was standing here where I'm taking this photograph and, and saying to myself, I'm not able to walk over there. This is simply not possible. I, I'm so weak because of this uh, stomach problem, um, bug problem, whatever it was. Uh, but then I said to myself, I'll take one step and then I will take another step, and then a third step. And sooner or later, I will be over there. I will uh, reach the, the, the place. And here I recognize that uh, I think it's the first time I've been sleeping in a pyramid tent in a sleeping bag of, uh, with a mummy closure. So, um, well, I was, I was uh, very much occupied with the the Keops, Keops Pyramid at this point of my life because uh, I was gradually having some uh, experiences which I could uh, only uh, term as recollections of a past life uh, crawling through the corridors of the Keops Pyramid. So I was also very, very fascinated by Mount Everest, which is pyramid shape. But we came over here, and uh, while we were here, a quarrel rised. Um, Bo was a guy with a fierce temper, and two of the participants were a couple with fierce temper. And they had their first encounter there. And that meant that from that place on the track, I was the diplomat. Uh, Bo and I were sharing a tent, and we were friends, so I could talk to him, and the, the a uh, married couple had confidence in me, so I could talk to them. And so I was kind of balancing all the way. And uh, at the same time, the monsoon was crawling in upon us. So we had these um, almost dark and white uh, visions here. And uh, <clears throat> this was the zero point for me in, in this place where we uh, spent the night. And there was uh, newly fallen snow on the top of these mountains in the back, you can see. And I think I, I only regained my health because Bo brought a tape recorder with the music of uh, Mahler and Richard Strauss, and then I was lying there listening to that uh, while the others were walking around. But I was healthy enough to, enough to um, go to the village nearby where there was a temple ceremony, and this is the orchestra with cymbals and some oboe-like instruments and some long, uh, almost alp horn-like instruments, which you will see in a moment, and dogs. And these uh, priests here, they made a very spectacular dance. You can maybe see these uh, 
Tumchin over here, the Alphorn like instruments. And uh, again, well, it's, it's the, the Nepalese music here, the Buddhist music, um, is a, a more like a, a, a kind of med meditation change of sound. Uh, I, I, won't, I wouldn't call it playing ability, actually. These priests, they had small bowls in their hands, and in these bowls they, were, they had ball, bowl, bowls of rice and butter. And uh, at the same time, uh, several times, they threw uh, these balls in the air, and, and then immediately this courtyard was filled with dogs <laughs> eating these uh, long life balls. And um, <clears throat> it was a wonderful mixture of holiness and everyday life. And uh, I, I took this picture uh, to just demonstrate the difference between uh, one of our participants and the Nepalese girls with their nose um, rings in the background. Well, now we can see the real Himalaya. And I'm changing here from Kodachrome 65 to Kodachrome 25, which means that the, the sharpness of the picture is even more pronounced. And when we reach over here on that path, we, we, give the, we get the first glimpse, glimpse of Mount Everest. And of course, I should have a, a photograph of myself in front of Mount Everest for the first time. And now uh, things were really getting beautiful. Children everywhere, and there's a lot of uh, flowers in this field, and they uh, shouted, Namaste, Namaste. And then they laughed and started running. But I, I moved my camera and clicked uh, following the, the, the children. So the children are in focus, and the other thing, the, the rest of it is not to illustrate the, the run. I, I quite like this picture. And as I said, Bo had a little tape recorder where he listened to <coughs> uh, all kinds of classical music. I think uh, mostly Mahler, Strauss. And the children, of course, uh, should see what that was all about. And we made a halt here to uh, wash our clothes, which you can see there are drying on this stone in the background. Well, some of our porters were not very old. I think this guy is 16 and he's carrying I think 30 kilos and um, we had a lot of speculations on slavery and masters and uh, servants and things but uh, as we were informed this is their living and they love it and, and they do it and they are strong and that's not a problem. And uh, this little guy here, when he reached the, the tents and realized that there were some of the ladies from the group which were far behind, he just ran back and took their um, luggage and carried it to, to uh, us, to the tents. And uh, we, uh, we passed here before we get into what I would call the, the real incredible nature, the Numbur View Hotel. Uh, where inside there is a fireplace on the floor and there's some benches if you like to sleep. And uh, Numbur is uh, up here. Uh, Numbur is, um, let me see, I've written it down. So it's 6,958 6, meters. And uh, this is it here. And um, it's very impressive. Uh, mountain and with these rhododendrons all over the place um, it's really a beautiful place uh, here it will where uh, the breathtaking parts really begin we're, we're going over this uh, ridge and we have to go down there and uh, all over here and up and into the Lukla airport and um, you can see this is, I almost <laughs> get tears in my eyes looking at that. It, this is so immense, I, I can't, I, I can't uh, describe it really. It, it's not because it's big, but it's, it's beautiful and big and it's silent. And, and uh, 
well, it's in, you are in awe of, of this. This is really incredible. And there's these rhododendron trees uh, all over the place. And um, I think I've taken a lot more photographs of rhododendron, but I, I wanted to spare you for some of them. There are these uh, magnolia-like or tulip trees, also tulip trees. And, and uh, this uh, trunk here, they, they take off the branches to feed the cattle. Um, this is a very typical photo from, from this walk that day. And even it's a bit uh, shaky, uh, I think it gives an impression of how it's to walk down. Sometimes it's uh, a little bit harder to walk down than to walk up because you, you, there's a kind of a push under your heel when you walk down. Uh, there's a special story connecting with these children here. Uh, they, they have picked these uh, flowers. Um, unfortunately, my, my light meter, I didn't have a spot light meter on my Olympus OM2, which was, uh, by the way, very, very fine because it's one of the first cameras measuring the light on the sensor itself as uh, you take the picture. Um, but, but it's a bit too light because the flowers are a, a, a little bit darker, almost like this. It was very beautiful. And when we went downhill, we went to this, there's a tea house here. A little family lived there. My first photo was of, of the big sister. And then the little sister came. And then we heard the children from before uh, making garlands of the flowers. And they were singing coming down the mountain. And when they were singing, this little girl, she stretched her arms into the air and turned around and started to dance. And it was wonderful to see. Now the rain is quite uh, heavy. You can see we have, the, our porters have uh, shielded our luggage uh, and um, a lot of our clothes and things were wet anyway. So the, the monsoon was coming earlier this year, which was uh, quite a problem. And uh, now and then we have to walk into these tea houses and have a cup of teas. Um, this is our, our cook, by the way. Um, um, Pimba, I think it was called. And um, this is where we're going. We had not uh, reached so far as to go almost directly north and in the end of this uh, valley uh, you might be able to see Mount Everest. Um, and, but it's raining and we are in a little call, town called Karikola where they are, there's a barley I think in the background and you can see um, in, inside to the left there's a lodge where we were having, having dinner. And um, th there was a lot of porters, and these porters carrying these bags, and every time they had to rest, they were supporting the bags uh, on on sticks. And um, this is our meal, and um, everything tastes tasted of smoke. And I, I be, made the error of bringing a thermo thermo canteen which means that the water you put into the canteen uh, keeps the temperature. And if you only drink boiled water, then it's too hot. So uh, that was not very good. So I can't recommend that. The rain stops, and, and uh, as the rain subsides, there's uh, these uh, wonderful uh, visions of clouds and light and darkness and um, this is almost true to the actual uh, vision of this dark house in, in the bottom with uh, something like a Christmas tree on the top and, and the clouds and the mountains. And then as soon as the rain, rain is gone, uh, every, everybody gathers on, on the square of the town. This is the butcher uh, selling yak meat. and. Um, here you have uh, the grocer, uh, egg, egg lady, and um, they have this. Uh, there's a problem with the letter F, 
So, for instance, if you have something called uh, 50 rupee, it's uh, 50 rupee. And if it's 55 rupees, it's 50 pip rupees. I don't know how that's why that's dif difficult. You can see our tents here <coughs> are <coughs> laid out to dry. And here's Minkyu, one of our Sherpas, uh, and uh, we will visit him at an earlier stage. This is looking down on Karikula area with the barley fields. <coughs> <coughs> um, and um, as I said uh, earlier, if you have a computer screen with, with a sufficient light, this is an incredible photograph. And if you get a bit higher, you have them even more beautiful there down to the left. Uh, this is our group of Sherpas, um, boys and girls, and a goat, which are the port. And um, we, we didn't get as long as to give it a name. Um, well, we, we <laughs> ate it for supper later. One of the classical rhododendron shots. And then we are um, so high up now, just before Lukla, that we are actually walking into that cloud and through that cloud. And then we have Lukla here. There's the airstrip over here. Um, <coughs> And this is a difficult place to land, and especially in 1983, it was a difficult place to land because uh, the airstrip was grass. If you go into YouTube and see, there's a lot of films from Lukla Airport. It's now concrete and much more safe. But here was it was uh, grass, and it was very sensible to rain. So the the flights come in that that way here and, and land on this uh, um, not level um, air strip and then they set off the passengers and turn around and then they take off again. And um, a lot of traffic here when you're going to um, climb Mount Everest or other uh, mountains in, in the neighborhood, Lukla is the place to together. And we went uh, a bit away from Lukla and I saw this very nice fellow who uh, ended up to be Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, first man uh, with um, Loke Tenzing on in 1953 on Mount Everest summit. And uh, being a, an Everest uh, fan, this was really it was surprising and an honor to me to have a, a talk with uh, this very, very kind man. And um, <clears throat> he was um, sponsoring things. His uh, fame uh, made it possible for him to start projects here in the Kumpu region of Nepal. And there's a school here where you can see there's the out outline to a, a new wing. And when we come back from the end of the trip and end up in Lukla again, you will be able to see that this new wing is actually finished. And then we visited uh, Minkyu and his wife and children. We, we bought him them some Danish paper cuttings, which were, they were very uh, pleased to receive. And they were very hospital. What is it called? Hosp the hospitality was uh, warm, and but it was uh, compared to Danish standards, very dirty. Uh, but um, who am I to judge? I mean, th th that's their life. I, I don't know what to do, other than watch and be be kind. Uh, the the route from Lukla to the the next village, Namtshebasa which is kind of a trading center in the area, uh, is very uh, populated with uh, horses and uh, carriers and trekkers and uh, mountaineers and uh, everything seems to, to go through uh, that route and over bridges like that, um, the Dutkosi River, uh, the Milk River coming down all the way from the area 
the Everest uh, area and lodges and tea houses everywhere and uh, you meet these uh, tsos as they're called which is a crossing cross between yak and uh, normal cattle and a uh, lot of stuff uh, luggage is carried along these paths uh, on these animals and we meet them all the time they were also carrying uh, our luggage at one point and and here between Lukla and Namche Bazaar uh, we had a, a stop and we went into a tea house to have some uh, lunch or something <coughs> and um, these girls they had a ghetto blaster and um, they turned it to maximum sound and then they went into the tea house and disappeared <laughs> and because I was outside and I think we were set putting up tents or so I, I just turned it a bit down and, and then they came out and turned it to maximum again um, and then I met Reinhold Messner the uh, Italian mountaineer and this was uh, quite a an experience for me to meet and this, uh, at the same day Sir Edmund Hillary and then Reinhold Messner who is not only the first person on Mount Everest alone and without oxygen but the first person in the world to climb all 14 summits uh, more than 8,000 meters and he was indeed very nice to talk to. He was on the route to Chuyu but uh, it was climbing to you, but by a new route. So uh, this is a life where, uh, well, we have climbed this 8,000 meters. Well, shouldn't we do it again, but from the other side? Well, incredible life. It took him 16 years to climb those 14 peaks. Um, going uphill, uphill, uphill to uh, this town called Namche Passar. As you can see on the snow and the weather, it was now very wet. It started with rain and then we, you go a bit further up and then it's loose snow, wet snow, and then it's actually snow. And then when you uh, reach the point here, uh, your boots are completely uh, soaked and, and uh, uh, all you can hope for is to get some dry clothes and dry boots. Uh, Namche Passar is like in a, built in a horseshoe, which you will see uh, clearly more clearly uh, later and in the background there there is a an abyss actually leading up to the mighty uh, Kongdehri massif in the background which we will also see in a minute and this is uh, the main street in uh, or one of them in Namche Basar which uh, it's all mud there, there's nowhere to th thread where your boots are not sinking into a, a lake or, or mud or something like that and children everywhere. So this is the next morning where the clouds are uh, rising and this is uh, Taviche. No, no, it's not. It's Samshaku, 6,608 meters. And um, we are now going uh, back or, uh, on, on the back of that uh, of a ridge down to a little village called Kumchung. And this is the Kongdari um, massive I, I talked about. That's uh, 6,187 meters, this peak up there. <coughs> and in the bottom you can see Namche Passar, which is uh, now gradually uh, leaving. First we're visiting a museum uh, there is for the area. And uh, the Mm, the reason which I, t I took this photo uh, is the bench. If you imagine you sit down on this bench and uh, take away the snow, this is the view you get. Uh, with Mount Everest, Lotse and Amadaplam uh, and Tavich uh, in the background here. And uh, the, uh, Mount Everest and, and Lotsa are over uh, 8,000 meters and Amadaplan is over 7,000 meters. So we, we are going um, further up and uh, into a small village. You can see here some of, uh, some of us are going up here from Namche Passar over here. 
<coughs> and even if it's a heavy snow, the weather is fine. Um, this is Namche Bazaar. You can see our our tents are put out to dry here. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful area, and this is the museum I talked about before. And and we we came all the way from here. Lukla is down there somewhere. <coughs> Uh, the light, you have to be very careful with the light. This is almost black and white, but it is actually in color. And um, you have to uh, make sure that you have uh, tight sunglasses. I had some leather strips I had put on, on the sides of my sunglasses. I didn't have those really snow sunglasses. <clears throat> what you see here is the end of um, of an airstrip. And I believe this is Terminal 1 over here. But if you turn around, this is the airstrip here. So you can take a flight from Kathmandu up here. And this is our group coming here. Uh, in order to visit uh, Everest View Hotel, which you will see in a moment. This is looking back at where we came from. And I'm, I'm so glad I have these photos. Uh, I, I can't tell you uh, the scope of this. This is so immense that uh, each look in each direction is completely incredible. And the air is, is clear and you can see everything apart, of course, from when there's clouds. So here you have Everest View Hotel. And um, this hotel uh, is in uh, the altitude of almost 4,000 meters. And uh, at the time we went there, it was abandoned. Um, there was nobody there. Um, and this is the dining room. And uh, I really, this is uh, one of the photos I'm really proud of. <laughs> the, the contrast between this uh, ketchup bottle in the middle and uh, Everest over there. And Amadablam and uh, and a lot here, um, but it's a problem if you fly from Kathmandu in thirteen hundred meters altitude, and so this hotel in almost four thousand meters altitude, you'll get altitude sickness, and in in uh, it's uh, opened in nineteen seventy one, but in eighty three it was closed. Um, and I have seen now, if you go to its, uh, the homepage, that uh, it's working, full working. But they advise uh, people not to fly from Kathmandu to Everest View Hotel because you will get attitude sickness for a f uh, three or four days. So instead, they, th they say fly to Lukla and then walk uh, up. If you walk up, you are uh, slowly acclimating. acclimating Seating, acting, what you, you, you get used to the altitude. Well, from here, we are going down to Kumchung here over here, and then up on this ridge over here, which is in almost four thousand meters altitude as well, where the Tengpoche Monastery is located. But um, we're going down here. This is Taweche, as I mentioned before. And you can see there's a village here with, with all the fields. And uh, it's still in color. Uh, this was the real colors, uh, almost black and white, but uh, very wonderful. This is Kumchung, where there is a, a hospital. And I can see now that there's tourist travels to Kumchung, where you can uh, live wonderful places. Everything is modernized now in, in um, in uh, comparing comparison to 1983, and Amadablam will follow us uh, uh, a long time. Um, th the the name means the mother's necklace, which is uh, due to uh, there's a, a glacier up here, like uh, a necklace, and it's a uh, 6,812 meters, and all these peaks here have been climbed several times by a lot of people. Well, it's a tough uh, trip actually, and, and two of the girls are, are sick now. I don't really remember from 
with what from uh, <coughs> flu or something. But they had to uh, stay here and uh, a Sherpa and a tent and they went back um, and they went up to, well, they stayed here and went to the Tengpoche Monastery to wait for us there when we came back. And everywhere uh, where we are, there there are people selling things. Um, they, they turn out of the blue in the middle of nowhere. And this girl is a woman as well. And it was her, actually, uh, who had uh, the price of uh, pip tip pip rupees for something she wanted to sell. And uh, Greta here to the left talked with one of these uh, Tibetan girls, I think they are. And uh, they were talking uh, th their own language. They didn't understand a word of what they were saying, but they were trading uh, some jewelry. So Greta had something she would uh, trade, and the girl there had something that she would trade, and then they communicated in no language. <laughs> that was a wonderful thing. The next morning, the clouds were gone, and you, it's a one, uh, in one direction you can see the, the Kongdiri, um, massive here, um, and here, this is also one of those photos I really think this is incredible, what a Kodachrom 25 can do. Um, this is um, Tam uh, 6,608 meters, and uh, uh, this is so detailed from the Kodachrom 25 that you can project it on, on a wall or side of the house and you will get all the details anyway. So now we're going over here to Tengpoche Monastery. And when we reach there, there's a small ridge up here. You might see where Bo and I, we went up in 4,000 meters altitude. And we're just going down the valley. And um, it's... Uh, I can't resist taking photographs. And then we meet a friend, as in Kathmandu. There are dogs everywhere. And uh, apparently they, they don't belong to anyone. So this, this dog, well, we gave it a bit of food. And then it followed us for a week. Uh, it didn't follow us to the, the top Lobuchi, um village, but it joined us again. And as you can see, it went uh, with us all the way back to Lukla. Uh, it was very sweet, very nice. I was hesitating to touch it because I could see it was extremely dirty. But anyway, I got uh, fleas in my socks. That was not that unbearable. Uh, here you can see the Tengpachi Ridge a bit closer. There's a path up here which we're following and then the monastery is here, and uh, Bo and I went up here the next day. We had a, a day of rest here, and there's a lot of beautiful uh, nature and trees, as long as you are under the uh, limit of trees, what you call the borderline, uh, altitude borderlines of trees. Uh, this bridge has, in the meantime, been... been um, uh, removed by uh, extensive uh, flooding but uh, reconstructed and and it's swinging when you walk at it on it and they walk over there with uh, the source the the yak the oxen oxes and uh, just a group photo of some of our Sherpas, where the girls have the time to wash their hair, and <coughs> some of us are resting in the background. And uh, this is one of those photos where the Kodachrome 25 is uh, difficult because the, the shadows is, uh, are very dark. As a, one uh, nice practical thing, you have a prayer wheel up here, and this prayer wheel is... Uh, motored by some kind of shovel uh, in a brook. So this means that you don't even have to touch the prayer wheel manually. It does it all by itself. So prayers are going to the gods all the time. Here's looking back. As you can see, the, it's raining. Uh, so the monsoon is uh, really too early. 
which uh, will create problems later. Um, the idea was that this should have been actually a snow-free walk. So we're almost at the top of the temperature ridge, and this is what we see as we cross over the top of the ridge and uh, on this uh, snowy place in the middle, our tents are going to be placed and you have a rest and lots in the background. And I think there must be uh, around 30 kilometers here to the top of Mount Everest. And <coughs> what you can see, um, well, it's clearer in another photo, there's snow blowing from the top of Everest. And uh, yaks are living here, and uh, calves, and uh, there's, uh, they're very cute, I must say. They're not as big as I thought, these yaks. Uh, Danish cows are quite big, but these are small animals, and the calf is even smaller. This is, shall we say, the classical photo of temperature monastery with Amadablam in the background and trees and graphic. But um, I love photographing with the 50 millimeter lens because this is actually what it looks like. Um, I understand the use of wide lenses in, in some cases, but I really prefer 50 millimeters. And after having slept uh, one night, this was the next morning. This is a sunrise behind Amadablam. And um, I don't think I'm able to express the beauty of this. Um, there was a snowfall during the night, so the snow on the tops of the mountains were completely new and, and extraordinary white. And um, I, um, well, this is Bo in, in the morning. Uh, the Sherpas come and serve tea for us. And uh, that's very nice of them. And um, you can see this is very early morning, a very clear light. And th here you can see the, the snow uh, from the tops of Everest and Lotse. This is not clouds, this is snow in the wind. And I simply took photographs all the way around to catch the, the sun of the morning sun, our tents here. I have a photo which is not so clear. The little dog slept outside our tent, but under Bo's sleeping bag. So uh, it, it had crawled in to uh, get some kind of warmth. It's just f taking photographs around. This is, again, one of those classical... There's a chutun <coughs> uh, and um, a yak. And uh, just the second before this yak was covered in snow, and as you might be able to see, is actually shaking off the snow, as would a, a dog do. And the yaks are all giving food uh, here over to the right, so they are uh, turning here and almost galloping up there to get, to get fed. Um, this is also something I, I could uh, amplify and, and have on a wall, I think. This is our camp in the Everest Valley uh, in, in the most beautiful weather you can imagine. And the most beautiful breakfast, I think, I had beautiful, most impressive surroundings. We went into the temple just to have a look at what was in there. And if you're a student of uh, Buddhism, there's a lot of treasures here. This is the library where its books are like uh, plates uh, wrapped in <coughs> in fabric. And uh, these are two of our porters. And uh, these uh, oboe-like instruments were the uh, same kind of those who were played in, in the village where the priests threw these long life balls uh, which were eaten by the dogs. And the Nepalese king, uh, that is before there was some uh, rather horrible things later going on in the Nepalese uh, royal family. And um, this is just before leaving. Uh, the shepherds will pack our, our tents down in a moment. We'll just go around and the monastery and see what what is there to see. The, these uh, 
prayer mills you find in connection with all the temples where you can turn them with one hand as you pass them. And this is also classical. This is a Lou, and I think it's it might be the, the most uh, beautifully placed Lou in the world with uh, 30 meters of free fall down and uh, the view of Mount Everest. Now we're packing up, uh, continuing um, to the next camp, but uh, while the shepherds are packing up, uh, Bo and I, we walk up, climb up, it's not climb, actually more than a walk, in an altitude of 4,000 meters, where you can look down on the monastery and, and see back, Kumchung is in here, the Evers View Hotel is actually there, and um, Kongdiri uh, is here. So, it's breathtaking. Uh, our shop is packing things up. This is what uh, one chopper is actually carrying on his back. And I haven't had a, uh, shown a picture of that, but they, they brought uh, chairs, as you can see, and um, boards to make tables so we could... Well, you had the breakfast just before, <clears throat> so we could sit comfortably. And uh, again, there was this discussion, uh, am I uh, come kind of uh, slave owner? But, uh, well, we, we were again and again told this this is uh, a trade, this is uh, the, what they want to do, this is, they're paid for it, and that's all right. There's a caravan of yak going uh, north here in the direction that we are also heading now. And um, going a little further, we reach uh, Pangpoche. This is actually looking back to the Kongdori Massif. Here in Pangpoche, they had a, a temple. And in this temple, they had the, the, the scalp and the hand of the abominable snowman, the Yeti. Uh, somebody had written a sign saying that the hand is actually a human hand, but please don't tell the monks that. Um, the scalp was supposed to be from a monkey of uh, uh, unspecified uh, class classification. I, I think I've read that these items were later stolen, actually. Now we're getting closer. As you can see, Mount Everest is disappearing behind the Lotse Nupse Ridge. So the closer you get to Everest, uh, the more it disappears. So the idea was to go left of, to the left of this ridge and reach Kalapatar so we could see Mount Everest clearly as on the first, uh, very first photo I showed. This is again looking back. This is Pangpoche here and the Tutkosi River, the Milk River. <coughs> and um, yeah, that's just beautiful. Mingyu sitting here waiting for us. He was a very, very nice guy. And uh, I couldn't resist Amadablam and uh, Moon at the same photo. And uh, somehow it's, it's a very enchanting mountain because of these two peaks. And there is a, a glacier here. It's like a moon landscape almost. And, and uh, I photoed this because if you look up this glacier to the right, it comes down from Amadablam, which we are now almost um, um, around, going around, and Annette with her red cap here. And yeah, still moon landscape like, and wet and wet and wet. And then we're going into Dingpochi, which uh, the main street appears to be some kind of stream where <coughs> everything was wet. But uh, again, this uh, is such incredible nature, and, and uh, I love these Kodachrome 25 film, where you, you get it as it really looks, and uh, imagine being there um, and uh, placing our tent here in the bottom, just below Amadablan. Amadablam in a 50 millimeter lens. I couldn't get the entire tent and the entire Amadablam, but maybe you get the impression 
of uh, the night nature here and dogs everywhere. We were sitting down having some lunch and then these puppies came and they were of course adorable but if you feed them they will follow you, you all the way and well we had we had already had a dog. Um, here we're going up from Dingpuchi and uh, you will be able to see in the background uh, Makalu, which is um, 8,463 meters. And we are still going up and up and up, looking back on Amadablam. And going in here to the left, to, to the right, in order to um, come to Kalapatar and the top range. <coughs> this is still looking back. And um, as I said, I've said it once or twice, uh, the, it's that impressive, not because of the immensity of that. This is 7,000, 8,000 meter peaks, but, but uh, it, it's, it's like uh, made by s such a giant hand that uh, you are in awe. I've, I've been in the Alps, I've been in Norway, which are uh, maybe Norway, I think, is the most beautiful place I've ever been. But this is uh, both beautiful and impressive. And um, you're feeling little and at the same, small and at the same time in, in contact with nature. The vi village of Periche down there, which we will we'll pass on the way back. And yeah, just one of those Amadaplam from the backside and us walking here. This is a, a bit strange, as you may be able to see, this uh, porter has bare feet. And again, the discussion, are they so poor that they don't have money for shoes? I don't think we can, we can't do that to our conscience, consciousness, conscience. But um, apparently they prefer that, uh, that they are, um, standing more, uh, in a more secure way on, on the stones, and they walk bar bare feet. This is the contrast. This is, the, this is me on the top of Mont Blanc, 4,809 meters. Bo had an uh, altitude a meter. So this is uh, as high as the top of Mont Blanc. And you can see I have some uh, leather things uh, sewn into my glasses, and it's very cold, and the light is extremely black, bright. And this uh, um, canteen, I didn't, I didn't want to recommend thermo. And so this is where the Alps end, and you just continue going up, going up, going up. This is just some impressions. This is uh, Pumori, which. Uh, is uh, the unmarried daughter of Everest, just it, it means that, that it, it's um, 7,161 meters. And uh, <clears throat> just below that, uh, I think may, you may be able to see, I think it's Kalapatar there, where, where, where our end goal is. But we reach uh, Lopuche, and this is cold. You can see I've, uh, I have a, um, underwear, a shirt, and a jacket, and an extra jacket, and a uh, neck cloth, and a uh, heavy uh, hat, and growing a beard, because it's, it's no use uh, bringing a sewing machine there. And Minkyu is serve, serving tea here. So, next day, uh, we're going to Kalapatar. Um, just some of us, uh, some of us are, are, some of us are a bit tired. But the sky is covered in clouds. So um, we walk, and uh, this is taken in 5,200 meters altitude, where <coughs> we decided to turn back. And um, um, trained mountaineers, for, for them, 5,200 meters is nothing. But to me, um, the, the lack of oxygen here means that you take one l tiny step and then one tiny step and then another one. So this means that we didn't reach Kalapatar and we had to go back to Lukla to catch a special flight. Um, 
if we had been smart, we might have taken a, sh- a tent and uh, some Sherpas could have, uh, one, just one Sherpa, and we could have gone to Kalapatar, spent the night there, because the next day, as you can see, the sky is completely clear, but we had to go back. Um, so there was a, some kind of disappointment here, because this was somehow the entire purpose of the trip, um, to see Mount Everest and close up. This is how the Sherpas serve tea in the morning. So we're just going back. This is Pumori again. And this uh, pass over here was, was the pass uh, where Dalai Lama and his uh, government fled over from Tibet um, in, what was it, 1954, I think. I, I'm not quite sure. But um, this is where he went. And I have two uh, photos um, following each other here, just to get an impression of um, going down, what that means, like this. And um, all the time you see these stones with uh, Tibetan prayer, or Mani Petbong, which is something about um, saving the lotus in your soul or something. I'm not quite sure. Um, <coughs> But it, it's uh, it's nice to meet that there's people everywhere here, and they um, they live up here in in the summer months and um, grow potatoes and uh, they have cattle. And here you can have a shower. Um, you go in this little hut, and uh, somebody goes up and pulls uh, water, and then you can pull the string and have a shower. Um, now the atmosphere in the group was really strange. This uh, quarrel between Bo and the married couple was now extreme and uh, somehow they were not able to uh, to settle that. Uh, they All three of them had uh, a violent temperament and there was uh, a lot of misunderstandings. Uh, I managed more or less to keep the, the balance between them but uh, that was quite a job to, to be a diplomat here. So I decided to walk alone um, for the next day uh, down to uh, the Tengpachi Monastery. So this is, uh, I, I walked I think on my, by myself for uh, four to six hours and uh, this was incredible to be all alone out here where if, if you if you are sick you have to uh, go for a week or something like that. Well, there is a hospital in Kumchung, but the serious things, you have to wait for a helicopter and, and you have to send somebody to a telephone, which is far away. So I, I went here and that path, I followed that. This is uh, around the um, Everest View Hotel. And this was, um, I think that was an uh, um, emotional experience. Uh, of uh, great quality to be by myself in this enormous nature. People of Pangpachi uh, planting potatoes. And uh, ag- again, this uh, is, is almost as it is in, in nature with this almost black and white graphic things <coughs> where I reached the, the trees and we reach Tengpachi and uh, uh, go on further. It's uh, the idea to get to one one more um, sleepover place and then to, to look like to catch a, a plane. And we are walking uh, here and here or, or over here you have Everest View Hotel. But now uh, rumors are coming to us. You can see the clouds and this is looking back on the <coughs> Tengpachi Ridge that uh, it has been raining for a long time. And because of the grass landing strip in, in Lukla, there hasn't been a plane for two weeks. And this means that um, if we reach, uh, if the, the plane comes that is ours, we will get that plane. But if it doesn't come, we'll go back the line and there are more than 200 people now queuing up in, in Lukla. This is what Nam Pasar looks like without snow. You might remember we had our, our tents drying up here. 
So it's very different landscape in snow and without snow. So so now the weather is fine and we are going down this quite steep thing from a uh, path from uh, Namche Bazaar and down to Lukla towards Lukla. And again, as I said before, going down uh, can give us some kind of push to your heels, which is uh, a bit more painful than going up, actually. <clears throat> I'm not a trained mountaineer, but of course I had had, had done some training and gone, I'd gone up, up and down the stairs in our building several times with my backpack in order to train. The two girls who were... Uh, uh, fell ill. They they hadn't this kind of training, so um, that's probably why they they didn't make it. But w we picked them up here at Tengpochi, and then there was this last view of Everest. If you go the other direction, this is the first view of Everest, and uh, I think this is uh, again completely incredible nature, and just walking down in wonderful weather. And there are these uh, prayer walls all the time. And uh, Bo and Ingrid is going over there. You have to go left of them for some reason. That's a religious thing. If you have read Tintin uh, Tan Tan, Tin in Tibet, you will see that Captain Haddock is going the wrong way. And that it means that Tintin is making a screech and you have to turn the next page page to see what that was all about. And that was him going in the wrong direction. Also, speaking of that, um, there's one of the other surprises in Hashi's description in, in, of Tibet, that uh, one of the salesmen we met in uh, Kumchung actually greeted us by um, um, sticking out his tongue, which means that um, he's an honest person, not speaking with two tongues. I don't think I don't know if that's that custom is still existing. Uh, this is actually just before Lukla to show that the dog is still there. And um, when we arrive almost at Lukla, we can see this is the school that Hillary was uh, establishing, and you can see the wing which was uh, gravel before this is now built. And also here we should have sound because you can see. Over here, the school children are lining up and they are singing. And, and they're singing, uh, and because singing so loud, or uh, because there's no sounds here, you can hear everything far away. And that was a moving experience. You really should have the sounds, but unfortunately, I didn't. So, this is Lukla. And this doesn't look good. And now, I'm facing a, uh, we're facing a crisis because uh, the, the married couple, they don't want to, f uh, to follow Bo any longer. Uh, if the plane comes the next morning, this is ours because we have the tickets. If the plane does not come, we go back in the line. And this means that we have to walk back to Kathmandu. And <clears throat> the travel agency um, which uh, the, the Nepalese uh, agency the, the had, had uh, there was some money for food, but the, there was no more money for food, not really. This means that um, going back to Kathmandu meant that uh, we had to split the group, which was uh, logistically very, very difficult, and there was not much food, and it will take a week. And this would mean that we would miss our plane in Kathmandu and miss our plane back to Denmark from Delhi over Frankfurt. So this this was uh, a no go, actually, and and uh, this uh, rain and and the grass um, airstrip. You should uh, look it up on YouTube. It's completely concrete now, so you can come and go as you like. I think. You see that they were trying to even out the airstrip in order to have a possible arrival that morning. <clears throat> and uh, there's a lot, all these people are um, queuing up in Lukla and this guy with the hat is actually Edmund Hillary. And um, then something strange occurred uh, to me. 
as I told you, I had um, these experience of the experiences of uh, which I couldn't uh, term as anything but recollections from past lives, which I told um, the other particip- participants about when we sat in the tents in the night. And one of them was crawling through the uh, corridor system of the Cherub's Pyramid 8,000 years ago. This is a very, very clear memory, which has I have written down in the Ring Paris diary, which you can see in the link in the in below. And um, I was sitting here, and, and the, the prospect of not being able to go back was terrible. And I was having dinner, and my little friend here looked at me, and I asked not especially God, but just out in the air, will I never get out of this pyramid? And then I knew I had a completely incredible experience. I knew that this plane would arrive. N- not that I hoped or uh, it's probable. I, I simply knew. Um, that's the first time I had, I've had an experience of that kind. It was really a religious experience, and it came, actually. It is here, day after. (laughs) And we rush into this Twin Otter plane to get to Kathmandu, and um, looking back where we came from, and the cockpit, some of the mountains we are passing over the Badanat stupa in Kathmandu and having had a shave and a bath and some food. <laughs> we, we had a few days left where I just uh, took some photographs of uh, life in Kathmandu in general. Um, these rickshaw guys here, like the group I showed before we went out and um, I like the the colors of of these uh, Kodachrome 25, especially here, um, where you could buy these uh, cotton, uh, no wool, I think it's wool, um, wonderful red color. And you could buy saris by this guy from India. I bought uh, uh, two saris to a friend I had. And the children everywhere, very, very happy to to meet us and greet us. And, and then the rain came. And I just came, there's a few photos of uh, the monsoon clouds arriving and getting, again, this strange, almost uh, black and white atmosphere resulting in heavy rain. You can see on the right over here, you can see almost the raindrops um, coming of a ricocheting uh, from um, from the sidewalk and they cleared out and uh, just took uh, around to some streets girls washing their hair somebody talking beneath the uh, uh, advertisement from um, Himalayan cement company I was told by a guy who can read that and then we went back and the jumbo from, we went to Delhi and then back from uh, Delhi to Frankfurt and taking off from Frankfurt and looking <laughs> at each other's slides here uh, after a while. So this is what it looks looked like when the plane arrived. and. Um, I'll let this be the the last photo. I'll put that on my Facebook page as well, because this was uh, incredible. It's like the end of pain, the end of conflict, like being rescued, like Frodo and, and Sam being rescued by the eagles in The Lord of the Rings. So thank you for following me here.